Hello, my name is Amalio Telenti. I am professor of genomics at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, in California. My main focus of research is in the analysis of human genomes at large scale, and I'm in particular interested in the understanding of those characteristics of genes and of non-coding genomic elements that are the most critical for human health. In my short presentation, I will go through several high-level questions, and I will just uh, present them one after another by highlighting a, a short uh, question and answer. The first question is, what's an essential gene? A gene can be defined as essential when its loss of function compromises the viability of the individual, for example, embryonic lethality, or results in a more general loss of fitness. And this can happen also extending through the adult uh, life of the organism or of the human. So once that we have these essential genes, how do we identify them in humans? And I make the emphasis here in humans because you are a community of uh, uh, scientists working with mice. At the population level in humans, we do the identification of essential genes through computational means. This means by gathering very large numbers of human genomes or exomes and looking for those genes that are never or rarely truncated. And the truncation can be achieved through uh, stop codons, premature stop codons, frame shifts, or other means. So when we approach the human population with this computational concept, we can estimate the number of genes that we will define as essential. And these are approximately 3,000 human genes. That's calculation from our group and from other groups working in same, this same field. Here, an essential gene, one of the 3,000 genes are those that cannot tolerate the loss of at least one of the two alleles. And this will be an important concept. That is a monoallelic defect that will be scored in humans to proclaim a gene as essential. On the other hand, we can also identify in the human population up to 3,000 genes with biallelic loss of function in potentially healthy adults. This would then deem to be dispensable. So 3,000 essential genes, 3,000 dispensable genes. In all truth, essentiality is a continuum. Even though we like to use these hard calls of essentiality and dispensability, we know that this is a continuum of uh, damage due to the loss of one or the two alleles. From this concept of the one allele emerges the importance of haploid sufficiency when we are discussing the human population. Why is that? It's because what emerges as a very strong message from analysis of humans is the dominant effect through the loss of one allele. This is simply because in the adult population, many of the genes will never ever be observed as biallelic knockouts, very possibly because these embryos will never be uh, successful. And however, we can still see the effects of loss of one of the two alleles, both in creating adults and human um, beings, but also increasingly we identify the consequences in the adult population of the loss of one allele through specific diseases. So once that I have discussed this unique approach through human population analysis to essentiality that is strongly biased towards upper sufficiency, how does this fit the mouse model? Roughly, in the literature, 30% of the mice genome uh, is thought to be essential for survival to adulthood in the mice. However, in mice 
we prominently score the impact of biallelic inactivation on embryonic lethality, which implies that to be able to generate biallelic inactivated um, genes in mice, we have to cross heterozygous loss of function genotypes. And these have to be viable and fertile to a large extent. However, many of these mice may or have a clinical or a laboratory phenotype. There is indeed an overlap between the genes deemed essential in the human population and those in the mouse model. For the most part, when there are differences, something that is called in humans essential and not in the mouse and vice versa, these are the reflection of important differences in what it is measured. In many, uh, to, to a large extent, this is dominant effects in adult humans versus recessive effects in the embryonic life in mice. So the next question is how to bridge between human and mouse knowledge. One thing that it will be very important for human clinical medicine will be that we increasingly capture the phenotypic information on the consequences of heterozygosis in mice. As this will be very interesting to, be tra to translate what actually is commonly observed in humans. That means a human with a rare variant that pro pro uh, produces severe damage to a gene. So it would be ideal that there will be extensive recording on the heterozygous state of the mouse of any possible medical, clinical, laboratory consequences in the phenotype. I want to conclude with one particular area of application that is uh, of increasing importance for drug development. The identification of truncated genes in humans offer an in vivo glimpse on the impact of natural lifelong loss of function variants in a gene. That means by looking at upper sufficient or a full knockout of a gene in humans and assessing how these people um, go through life, we can then decide how a drug that targets the same gene will perform. There are very good examples now in drug development. One of the earliest ones was the development of a CCR5, a chemokine receptor antagonists for the inhibition of the entry of human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, into cells. This drug is in the market, is in use, and it was rapidly developed because we already knew that humans could live healthy lives despite of the loss, complete loss from a truncation of both alleles of the gene. As a matter of fact, up to 3% of the human population, particularly in Europeans, live without CCR5. And therefore, the drug companies knew that targeting that gene would be unlikely to have adverse effects on the individual when used in chronic treatment. More recently, drug companies have developed monoclonal antibodies to inhibit PCSK9. And this is for cardiovascular health. Humans with PCSK9 loss of function alleles already and frequently just heterozygous are known to have a significant reduction in myocardial infarction and lead very healthy lives. Therefore, the rationale to develop drugs that achieve this cardiovascular protection by knowing that humans with the same effect but achieved naturally by loss of function um, were leading normal healthy lives with low rates of heart disease. So I want to conclude my presentation here with one simple message. There is a great value of intersecting human population data with mouse model data. There is very much importance in understanding the properties of each one of 
these systems, human population versus mouse models, to understanding gene function and disease. And I encourage the mouse uh, community to think about the experiments and the follow-up of their mice so that we can achieve a better understanding of the, of the com concept of aplysufficiency in humans. Thank you for your attention.